Waterville, Maine, September 26, 1931. Abraham Levine, a local cattle dealer, sits at his bedroom desk writing a check for $10. A shadowy figure walks in holding a 32 caliber revolver. Four bullets are fired, two in the head, one in the stomach, and one near the heart. Medical examiner Dr. John G. Town later declares that three of these shots could each have killed him. The housekeeper, Eleanor Johnson, returns from a night out at the movies. She discovers the body laying in the dark, doesn't recognize who it is, and calls the police. The cops get confused and don't show up, so she goes into town to tell them in person. But first, she stops off at a dance hall where Abraham's older brother, Merton Levine, is dancing. She tells him what happened, and he rushes home before the police get there. Someone murdered Abraham Levine, and it seems obvious who's going to be accused first. Now, black people in the United States have been treated pretty poorly throughout most of its history, and this story of Eleanor Johnson that we're about to dive into gives us a snapshot of what race relations in 1930s Maine looked like, and it wasn't very good. However, we're going to be getting into a lot of the details of the questioning that was done towards Miss Johnson, and while we can't really draw any conclusions, having not been part of the investigation ourselves, um, there are some circumstantial details that are very, very suspicious with regards to certain person who was let off the hook who may have been involved in this murder. So without further delay, I'm your host, Yona Paley, and today we're gonna to be talking about the life of Eleanor Johnson and how she was embroiled in this murder of Abraham Levine. The conclusion, which may surprise you a little bit, particularly the conclusion to Eleanor's life. So let's dive into the story. Eleanor Johnson was born 1894 in Caroline County, Maryland, to farm laborers John and Hannah Johnson. At the age of 17, she had a son, Emmons, with an unknown man by the surname of Young. The mother and son moved to Maine, where she took on various domestic housekeeping jobs. In July of 1929, she found herself employed at the home of the Levine family, successful cattle merchants. Louis Levine was a Russian Jewish immigrant from modern-day Divonishkis, Lithuania, and he and his family had settled in Waterville, Maine. There, they had six sons, including Abraham, the murdered son, and Merton, the one who we're about to talk about. According to court testimony, Eleanor and Merton had begun a romantic relationship in 1930, she 36, and he 20 years of age. It had taken aggressive police questioning to get Eleanor to admit to the relationship, something which Merton initially denied when confronted about. Inspector McGuire would later call him a rat for having such a callous attitude toward women. Eleanor claimed that Merton had asked her to buy him a gun, and that afterwards he had revealed to her that he had committed the murder. Now Merton vehemently denied the claim and said he was being framed, and to nobody's surprise the defense made clear its intention to place full blame on the housekeeper. While newspapers conveniently mentioned little about Merton's race, they consistently reminded the public that Eleanor was black and so things were not looking good for her. Although both of them were arrested, the grand jury decided not to indict Merton, but they did indict Eleanor. There were questions over whether the gun she had purchased was even the gun that was used in the killing, and at the end of the day, it was her word against his. Pages of detail about court testimony and questioning showed the story from Eleanor's point of view. She maintained that she had no knowledge of Merton's intentions, although there was one time where he was so angry at his brother that he had told her that he could kill him. After Abraham's death, she said, he had exclaimed, oh, why did I do it? He had also later answered police questions evasively, exclaiming, I didn't murder my brother, multiple times instead of properly explaining his side of the story. Prison was tough for Eleanor. She lost 20 pounds and went through a great deal of mental strain a strain which she credited only God for helping her get through. But finally, when the trial came, there were some saving graces. Several witnesses had seen and remembered her at the movie theater on the night of the murder. She had gone to see a mystery film called The Spider, 
and that was corroborated in a big way, both through ticket sales as well as eyewitness accounts. After a tense several hours and an impassioned plea from her defense counsel, a verdict was given. Not guilty. The courtroom burst into applause, which lasted several minutes. Eleanor was freed, and Lewis and Merton Levine returned to tending their cattle business. The mystery is still considered unsolved to this day. But what became of Eleanor? You may be surprised to learn that she had quite a lot of life left to live. Following her release, she remained in Maine for some time before moving to Scarsdale, New York. She eventually married a man named Charles Robinson, and through her son Emmons, had dozens of grand, great-grand, great-great-grand, and great-great-great-grandchildren. At age 84, she gave a follow-up interview about the case, lamenting the fact that she was treated differently for being black. And if you think the story ends here, well just wait, because 25 years later, at the age of 109, she was presented the Boston Post cane by the town of Skohegan, Maine. She had outlived her son Emmons, who had himself made it to the impressive age of 89. And what was the key to her longevity? Well, nothing really, except the fact that she took a teaspoon of honey daily along with a shot of brandy. She was a devout Jehovah's Witness and was in excellent health until the very end. One year later, on November 16, 2004, Eleanor passed away, a super centurion at the age of 110. Her obituary mentioned nothing of the drama which had taken place more than 70 years before. It was a different world now, and she had made it through in spades. Now, if you were paying attention to the details of the murder story, Merton Levine never went to trial. He never made it past the grand jury, and in fact, Eleanor was put on trial and acquitted because all the details she gave that she testified to were backed up by eyewitness evidence. She had been to the movie theater, she had the movie stub to prove it, and this is where, while I can't claim to know what happened in this case, I have a very strong suspicion there would have been a huge incentive for them, unfortunately, to pin the blame on the black woman who had been living with them, rather than admit that their son may have murdered their other son. And this just goes to show the levels of injustice that were around, especially back then, that people were so quick to jump on the black person as being the criminal. And we can see it in how she's talked about in the newspapers. She's always referred to by her race. The members of the household are not referred to by their race. She is. She's the one who ended up in jail. She's the one who had to defend herself. Even though she clearly stated many times that she had a relationship with Merton, he at first tried to deny that. She turned out not to be true. She gave very detailed um, explanation of how she bought the gun for him, how he asked her to buy the gun. And unfortunately, everything was basically pinned on, well, She's lying. She's the one who did this. You can draw your own conclusions. Let me know in the comment section below. But um, that's kind of my personal opinion. Once again, I don't have all the details of the case. I wasn't a police commissioner and I wasn't around then. But I would like you guys to just read through some of these newspaper clippings if you can. Come let me know what you think about this case. Was it Merton? Do you think it was somebody else? And then thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one.